Hello everyone and welcome to a little whimsy on the weekend. I hope you're staying warm because here it is downright cold. It is six degrees and dropping. My understanding is we will get down to a negative one or so. So, burr. Today I thought I would talk about a favorite topic from my blog, the anatomy of a straw bonnet. Now, it's no surprise that this is also one of my favorite topics because I absolutely love straw millinery. Now, to work our way through this topic today, I'm going to break it into two parts. We'll talk about the basic structure of a straw bonnet, and we'll talk about the finishing components of a straw bonnet. To do this, I'm going to bring out the two illustrations from the original blog post that I did and two bonnets. One is an original study piece, and one is a reproduction that I just worked on this last week. Okay, let's get started. Now this first piece is the original study piece. Now you'll notice that it is a little um, worse for wear, and yes, my hand is sticking right through it, but this gives us a unique opportunity because this is where I want to start in the anatomy of this bonnet. This piece that's missing in the back, actually separate the pieces right here, is the piece called the tip. And we'll start with looking at that. Now this is the tip that goes on the back of this bonnet. The tip is the very back of the bonnet. It is what the crown, which is the next part, develops from. Now you're gonna notice that this tip is circular, round. It's not oval, it's not horseshoe shaped, it is round. Now, sometimes you'll have a slight oval, sometimes you'll have a slight squaring, but at the core of a tip is this spiral creation. If it is made out of plate, it is truly sewn in a spiral. If it is woven, it is created in a way to mimic that spiral. Now you're going to notice, I'll turn it over here, bring it a little closer, hopefully you can see that. This gives us a nice opportunity to see the stitching inside of this straw plate. This is beautiful, fine straw plate. It is, ooh, I should have measured this for you. This straw plate is just over a quarter inch wide. All right, so this is a little over a quarter inch wide straw plate. And you can see, hopefully, come on little camera, the rather long coarse stitches on the inside. Now on the outside, those corresponding stitches are quite fine and nearly invisible. The cotton or linen thread basically disappears into the straw plate. I can tell you from experience that the thread is sometimes more visible as you're sewing it, and then it disappears a little bit more when you're doing the blocking or sizing processes. The sizing and the moisture um, helps that thread sink in and, and kind of vanish into the color of the straw. And let's back up one more moment. I don't know if you can see right here is a tiny little tag. This is a number. And this little number likely indicates who sewed this particular straw bonnet. Okay. I'll talk a little bit more about the sewing of straw bonnets and the women that sewed them in a future video. All right, so once we've talked about that tip, let's talk about the crown. So as you come from the tip to the side of the bonnet, this whole section through here is the crown of the bonnet. Now, part of the crown does develop underneath the tip, along the neck edge. Sometimes this is a couple inches wide. Sometimes it's quite narrow. It does vary from bonnet to bonnet. Now let's take a look at how that looks on my reproduction here. All right, let's see if I can get the angles right, <laughs> the reverse camera. I have a slightly narrower section here at the neck edge. 
but you can see how the crown is nice and smooth and it's developed by rows of straw plate. All right. And I can tell you that this straw plate is also just over a quarter inch wide. Let's go back to my original here. And I think you can see a little better on this side how the rows of the straw plate develop the shape of the crown. Here is an actual separation in the straw plate, but this stands out a little bit better, might be easier for you to see. All right. So then the next part of the bonnet from tip to crown is then the brim. Now, some individuals will consider just this very front part the brim, but I like to consider this whole section here from the projection up and forward and the drop down into the cheek tabs, the brim. This whole piece here, okay? Now, this is developed, let's see if you can see, right here on this bonnet, there's just a single graduation piece. This pushes the brim upward and forward. This particular bonnet is rather shallow compared to my reproduction piece, so it doesn't need as much projection forward or upward. Let me do that again. Forward or upward. You can see how that angle would be upward. All right hop back over to the reproduction piece. This has a more extreme angle up and forward, creating more of a spoon shape. And that's that curve to the brim. So if you hear the phrase spoon bonnet, which is common in interpretation and reenacting realms, that is this curve here because it reflects the curve of the shape of a spoon. So this piece would be considered a spoon bonnet. While this one, I do not believe would be. It simply does not have the height nor the forward projection of a spoon. All right. So next, let's go on to talk about the cheek tab. This will be the easiest way to hold this. The cheek tab is this drop down here. This is the piece that comes along the jawbone and along the cheek area. This is the part that when you're looking at it face forward, when it is worn, this is framing the face through here. This is the cheek tab. Now notice that it is a single line down to the cheek tab. And while this is a slightly more triangular cheek tab, it is still rounded here at the bottom. I'll pop back over to the reproduction. So here we have the cheek tab as it drops down, the single line along the brim, and it is bound here along the neck edge, and it is curved here at the bottom. And again, from the front, this is curved to frame the face. Okay. Now I've mentioned that neck edge a few times. Let's come back over. Looking at this piece, you can see there's a piece of straw that follows the entire neck edge of the bonnet. Okay. And again, there's a little tag back here with that same um, number it's the same font as the number i believe this is the style at the time uh so this neck edge binds the edge of the neck and basically encompasses all of those rough edges all right now you notice this piece is quite floppy to say it's actually quite supple for its age it was originally wired let me pull out the wire here and you will see why I opted to remove the wire. It was actually causing more damage to the bonnet than good. I'm gonna grab this little piece. This is 
a wire that is covered. Let's see. This one does not focus quite as well. There we go. I think that's the best we're going to do. This is a covered wire, covered with a thread. It's a white thread. All right. I can tell you that it is cotton. Now, when I do my pieces, of course, I do wire them, but I opt to cover them. Now, when looking at originals, a good number of them are uncovered, a good number are covered. I find covering the wire helps in terms of safety of covering the wire and the longevity of a piece because the wire is covered. It just helps the bonnet last a little longer. All right, so we've gone over the tip, which is the back, the crown, which is what encompasses the back of the head, the brim, which is what frames the face, and the cheek tab, which is the lower part of the brim, framing the lower part of the face. Now, we're going to move on to our illustrations. And I will pop them up over here. Thank you, technology. And I'm going to look at them here. All right. So well, let's talk about lining. Lining will protect the straw from your hair and your hair from the straw. It protects the straw, particularly when you start perspiring, which let's be honest, 90 some degrees, we're going to perspire. Now, not all straw bonnets actually have a lining or actually show, even show evidence of having a lining. I can tell you that this one did have a lining through the brim area and a separate piece through the crown area. This one might be the easiest to see. It is quite thin. It is quite like um, a tarlatan or a, a stiffer wiry gauze. Let's see if I can give you a decent look at that. Okay, I'll add a photo. I wonder how long it's going to take before I get over pointing to those. Now, in the case of our original here, the lining was through this section and through this section. And I do not know if there was one's lining in the tip, but I did not see evidence suggesting that it was. Um, plus, the tip was completely broken off. Okay. Now that we've talked about the basic parts of the straw bonnet, let's move on to talk about the finishing aspects of the bonnet. Now, one of the most common questions I get is how does the bonnet stay on your head? So let's talk about the components that help a bonnet stay on your head. First, and possibly the most obvious, are the ties. Now, a bonnet's going to have two sets of ties. You can see here in the illustration there are functional ties, and decorative ties. Those functional ties are often narrower, about an inch wide, and usually set on the inside of the cheek tab. These are the ties that are gonna help hold the bonnet to your head by tying centrally underneath your chin. The decorative ties are gonna be much wider, three, four, five inches wide. They could be solid silk, plaid, moires, stripes, plaids, I'd say plaids, florals, and a combination, of course. Now these, while tying under your chin, again centrally, and over top of the functional ties, these ties won't necessarily hold the bonnet to your head. They're not going to be quite as tight as that functional tie underneath. Now working, working together with the functional ties are actually those cheek tabs. As you get into the later 1850s and 1860s, those cheek tabs have extended down below the jawline and are curved in a way that it helps hold the bonnet to your head. 
because at this point, the bonnet is simply perching on the back of your head and the front of the bonnet is really doing the most of the job. Now, if we work our way up to the top of the brim, there are gonna be two components at the top that will help hold the bonnet to your head. Believe it or not, the frill or decorative cap on the front interior of the brim actually helps hold the bonnet to your head. The frill is a gathered or box pleated um, silk net, silk organza, or a lace that will help frame the face but the back part, that gathering or box pleating, actually hold, acts as a gripper and holds to the edges of your hair or your head, helping secure that bonnet in place. Now, some bonnets just behind this frill or cap will have what's called a bonnet stay. Now, I do have a whole separate blog post on bonnet stays as well as a video, so you can hop over and see a little bit more on how a bonnet stay works but those can be added to just about any bonnet after the fact and really kind of customize to your head. Okay, so those are the components that help hold a bonnet to your head. Again, those are the functional ties, the cheek tabs, that frill or cap, and the possible bonnet stay. The next thing I wanna talk about is the bevelet. Now the bevelé, which is sometimes called the curtain, is the piece of fabric that runs along the neck edge of the bonnet. Now this runs from the sides of the bonnet, across the back of the bonnet, and to the other side. So along that very neck edge that I showed you earlier. Now a bevelé most often was made of silk. Commonly it was cut on the bias, though occasionally on the grain. It could be made of silk fabric or silk ribbon. In the case of ribbon that was cut on the bias, it would be pieced together. And you can actually find the salvage edge to salvage edge joints in many original bevelets. Now, if you look at the illustration, you can see there's quite a loft to the bevelet. The bevelet is not hanging limp. It almost flies or floats like a bird would. Now, this is because the bevelé is lined with a cotton net. This net has just a bit of stiffening, sizing, or maybe a starching to it to give it that beautiful loft. Now, when it is attached, it's most commonly attached with some pleating, though occasionally with gathering. And like I said, it does reach all the way to the sides from the back. You'll notice looking at originals, that the back tends to be a little bit longer than the front. It's either cut as a tapered trapezoid or a slight curve, depending on how it's actually constructed. And there is some variety in that. Okay, now that is the last decorative piece I really am gonna cover in detail. The rest, the decorations, truly is another video. But just in brief, you're going to find some decorations on the interior of the brim, and that placement will vary depending on what years you're looking at. If you're looking at the late 1850s going into the 1860s, those decorations will primarily be placed at the top of the brim. If you're looking earlier, like the early 1850s, late 1840s, those interior decorations will fill more of the brim with the primary placements towards the sides, kind of towards the temples. And that really brings attention to the eyes in that direction. On the exterior, you're gonna have a variety of placements as well. Sometimes they sit at the top or the top sides of the brim, uh, a little asymmetrically more on one side than the other, or where the cheek tab rises into the side of the crown. So a variety of placements, and it really does get um, rather detailed or involved and, and can be another video. So I'll add that to my list. I hope you enjoyed this video. I, it's been a long time coming. I've wanted to do it for, goodness, at least a year. Uh, I've just kept procrastinating. I, I know people love the blog post itself. 
I would love to have some feedback or some questions, please put those in the comments below. If you liked the video, please hit the like button or even the subscribe button. Check out the, the video on the bonnet stays. As you can tell, the weather was much, much warmer then. Uh, <laughs> I dressed a little bit differently. And hopefully you'll come back and watch a few more videos in the future. Thank you.